Since time immemorial, humankind has looked to the stars. The universe has always been a source of fascination and of mystery. How was the cosmos born? What else might the universe contain? And where do we come from? Mankind is fascinated by these questions and by the search for answers. It is also fascinated by the idea of traveling to our neighbor planet, Mars. Mars holds a magical appeal for us humans. Is there life on the red planet? Could we live there? Welcome to Space Time, featuring astronaut and scientist Ulrich Walter and an expert on surprises the universe has in store for us. August the 2nd, 2048. A spacecraft has just reached Mars. The crew have landed on the red planet. One giant leap for mankind. 79 years after the first moon landing, man has set foot on another planet. This is a fictional scenario, but men on Mars will become a reality. August 2nd, 2048 is a date that should be highlighted in the calendar. Why? Because that's probably when a human will set foot on Mars for the first time. Why so late, you might ask? Because there are still lots of hurdles to overcome. But these hurdles can be overcome. And then human beings will fly to our neighbor planet. Mars has always fascinated humans, but interest was only seriously kindled in the last century when a certain Giovanni Schiaparelli observed Mars through a telescope and thought that he could make out canals built by human hand. Thereafter, people had visions of small green Martians. Entitled War of the Worlds, a new novel appeared in which Martians visit Earth. So as you can see, at the start of the last century, there was no shortage of vivid imagination. Mars has fired human imagination ever since it was discovered. The conquest of the red planet by Earthlings in an inevitable battle against Martians. Over many years, millions of cinema goers have experienced the arrival of Martians on Earth, never friendly and usually green. Humans on Mars, as conquerors, or, as in the Hollywood blockbuster The Martian, as peaceful researchers in the struggle against the hostility of our neighbor planet. It's a recurring theme in novels and films. We have known ever since the 1960s what it looks like on Mars. Dozens of probes have visited the red planet and sent back photographs and data. There have been reports of storms and barren deserts. In the end, we are left with more questions than answers, especially the burning question of life, past or present, on our neighbor planet. Only a manned mission to Mars will solve the riddle once and for all, when scientists and engineers research the red planet on the spot. It is very clear to me that those manned missions to, uh, to Moon and Mars, uh, human missions, will happen, but I don't know when they will happen. That's a, a decision of society. That's, um, that's our decision. Uh, the technology is almost there. We can decide now that uh, it's important to, for us to do that, and it is uh, important for several reasons uh, to, to do that, but we need the decision as a society. And once we do that, we're ready to go, basically. NASA was already thinking about manned flights to Mars in the early 1960s. So far, only unmanned missions have been undertaken to Mars, explorers in an alien world. Launched by the Soviet Union, the first probe landed on Mars in 1971. In 1975, 
the Americans followed suit when Viking 1 touched down on the surface of the Red Planet. The million-dollar question is whether Mars even had environmental conditions which made life possible. Was there a second genesis on Mars? Above all, the search for life on Mars means a search for water. The first pictures were fairly disappointing. It looked like it does on the moon, completely barren and empty. But we know that at one time there were huge oceans on Mars, so that water must be somewhere, and it can only be beneath the surface, a realization that put Mars in the spotlight. In July 1997, Pathfinder landed on Mars. On board the US probe was a robot, Sajina became the first rover to explore the surface of Mars. As newer and newer robots have arrived, it is not only the planet itself which is being researched. A landing on Mars represents a huge challenge. The atmosphere is so thin that ordinary parachutes would fail. So, along with the robot missions, engineers are also developing technologies for a future landing by man. But why? Why does everyone want to go to Mars? It's quite simple. Let's take a look at the planets in our solar system. There are the huge gas giants, as they're called. They don't have any solid surface because they're comprised solely of gas. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. All of them just gas. Are we interested in them? Then there are the four others known as the terrestrial planets because, like the Earth, they have a solid surface. But the temperature on Mercury, which is closest to the Sun, is as high as 430 degrees Celsius. Venus, a little further away from the Sun, has an extremely dense carbon dioxide atmosphere and thus a surface temperature of up to 500 degrees Celsius. Are they of interest to us? Not really. The Earth is lovely, but we know it. And now we get to the point. The planet which is closest to the Earth and thus reachable still lies within the habitable zone, the range in which temperatures are just right. Today, however, the temperature on Mars is around minus 50 degrees Celsius. So it's a bit too cold. But we know that many millions and billions of years ago, it had oceans and looked almost exactly like Earth. So the question is, did it perhaps also support primitive life back then? And that is why we want to go there. Conditions on Mars have been so well researched that a manned mission is now planable. The probes and robots are the scouts for future explorers. The various robot missions have already given us a very good picture of the different regions on Mars. Mapping has progressed considerably. We know how often sandstorms occur. We know all about their density and temperature. Naturally, having all this data is of vital importance to survival. It is now regarded as certain that there used to be water on Mars. Evidence has also been found of methane, an indication of life we know that there is water on Mars in frozen form, but we still have no idea what lies beneath the surface of the planet. These issues now intrigue us far more, and we still lack detailed knowledge of the composition of the atmosphere, whether there are still traces of life there, or what effect life has on the atmosphere. Ice has already been found. ExoMars, a joint Russo-European project, will, it is hoped, provide further answers. March 2016, ExoMars sets off on its search for life on the Red Planet. Over the next 10 years, I think we will see further robotic missions to Mars. The ESA has launched a mission to our neighbor planet. On arrival, a lander will detach and enter the Martian atmosphere to gather important data. Over the next few years, the orbiter will circle Mars and make a detailed analysis of trace gases in the Martian atmosphere. This excursion to our neighbor planet will be spread over several missions and cost two and a half billion euros. 
The main objective is to determine how we actually fly through the Martian atmosphere. The satellite is equipped with temperature sensors. We have an acceleration sensor which measures the retardation, and we have a small camera for pictures. In the second stage of the ExoMars mission, a robot will land on the surface and search primarily for biological material. On the second mission, which will follow in 2020, we plan to drill into the surface to find out whether something akin to life exists or existed there. How has Mars changed over the last few million years? Why did a planet full of oceans become a hostile desert? Such questions still preoccupy scientists. So, what have we gained so far from the numerous robotic missions to Mars? We know every square centimeter of Mars. We have mapped it with great precision. We have exact knowledge of the chemical composition, not only of its surface, but also of its atmosphere, which is mainly carbon dioxide. One thing we don't know, however, is the answer to the essential question of whether there is or was life on Mars, even in the most primitive form. No robot can tell us this. We need an experienced biologist to look through a microscope and say, that's it. That's something I've never seen before. It's extraterrestrial life. And that's why we have to undertake a manned mission to Mars. The question is no longer if or why man should fly to Mars, but when. Man has always been driven by curiosity, and that is why he will also travel to Mars and beyond, for sure. A manned mission to Mars would be mankind's greatest adventure since landing on the moon. If it's possible, we should do it. It doesn't have to be because we might bring back something fantastic that would make it all worthwhile. The gain will be that we can do it. The explorers of the 21st century will travel through our solar system and set foot on an alien planet. The scientific benefits of such a mission would be huge. Sure, we can always send all kinds of robots to Mars and have everything analyzed there. That's all possible. The fact is, though, humans are still a thousand times better than any robot. In my view today, it's no longer a case of whether to send robots or humans to Mars, but of sending robots and humans. Because one thing is clear, robots are very good at performing repetitive, dull and dangerous tasks. But where exploration is involved and the creative mind of a researcher is called for, humans are vastly superior. But before man sets up home on Mars, a few problems still have to be solved. Naturally, we know all the basic technical requirements for getting to Mars and surviving there. But there are so many technical details that still need to be solved. When we land on Mars, for example, naturally, we will do so with the help of rockets. But what exactly will the lander look like? It hasn't been built yet. And if we're to live on Mars for several years, what form will our life support system take? We don't know. And how are we going to get the fuel necessary for traveling back to Earth? We still don't know. That all has to be designed, and yet there are still a few people saying, that's of no interest to us, we're just going to fly there no matter what. In 2012, a startup company in the Netherlands really caused a stir within the international space travel community. It drew up a project named Mars One, which promised nothing less than the colonization of Mars. Modern-day pioneers from the Earth are going to populate our neighbor planet with no chance of coming back. Our plan, of course, is a mission of permanent settlement, so the crew, are, the crew is staying on Mars, and instead of trying to bring them from Mars back to Earth, which is practically impossible, uh, we're going to send additional crews every two years. A one-way ticket to the future, living and dying on Mars. If NASA is going to send humans to Mars, they, they can't leave them on the surface because for a country to say we're going to send some of our citizens to Mars and leave them there, that's, that doesn't work. So uh, that's the feedback I get from NASA is that they will never be able to do that. 
Worldwide, hundreds of thousands of people have applied to participate in the Mars One project, fully realizing that they will never return. Like Robert Schröder, a student from Darmstadt. I'd like to achieve something up there as part of a team. In other words, take humankind and technology a step further. I'd also like simply to explore Mars and find out whether or not there is life up there. Young, healthy, no family, and an IT student, Schröder has the best prerequisites for a future settler on Mars. He is among the last hundred applicants still being considered. I believe the moment will come when I really will board the rocket. There's a lot that I will miss, but it's the path I want to take. Living on Mars, life enclosed in a container. Stepping outside without wearing a spacesuit would mean sudden death. No forests, no lakes, no new book. A life focused solely on survival. We are very clear about the fact that this is a permanent settlement mission, a one-way trip. So our crews will have to decide for themselves, is this something that I want to do or not? And those people who don't want to do that, they don't apply for our mission and they shouldn't go. Um, and of course, at any moment until departure, uh, the teams can drop out. And I would not be surprised if the first team that we select uh, climbs the rocket and one of them says, Sorry, guys, I changed my mind, I don't want to do it. And what is still totally unclear is how the new settlers on Mars will feed themselves. Mars One thinking is focused on greenhouses in the accommodation containers. Tests are being carried out to see if and how plants could thrive on Mars. The lives of the settlers would depend on them. A vegan existence. Should the harvest fail or the plants die, it would be the end the settlers would starve to death. A biologist at Wageningen University in the Netherlands is studying the possibility of growing plants on Mars. The atmosphere on Mars is totally different. In fact, the planet has hardly any atmosphere. It's extremely cold up there, normally 60 to 80 below. So growing anything outside is simply impossible. What we will do is go underground, build a house and grow vegetables in it. Water is present there in the form of ice. And that's what we will use to grow our plants. Cress, radishes, rye, the first experiments have been promising. Even tomatoes grow on the simulated Martian soil. It's amazing how these carrots have grown. We never expected it. Things are looking very good and we're expecting to have a very good harvest. We've also got Martian soil here. The produce really is edible. Only the spinach is struggling a bit. The composition of the artificial Martian soil was provided by NASA. The soil also contains heavy metals, so we have to be sure that it doesn't get into the potatoes or the cress and make us ill. A Mars meal would consist of vegetables and cereals. Herbs could also be grown and perhaps fruit too. We haven't gotten around to fruit yet. We'll give it a try next year, because strawberries are very tasty. There's radiation on Mars, and although the settlers will be protected against it, eating strawberries will be an added help. So next year, we'll also have strawberries. The concept for financing Mars One is in tune with the times. The plan is for the money to come from reality TV shows, living on Mars in a Big Brother container. I think it's ethically irresponsible to send people to Mars or wherever without it being clear how they could return in an emergency. I find it unacceptable in our modern-day society. The big difference is that the pioneers who went to America hope to find a better life. If we fly to Mars, we know we will have to live in tin cans and no one will be able to provide help. 
For me, that's unacceptable. But Mars One has generated public interest in missions to Mars. I think that every great journey undertaken by our generation, every grand project realized by our society, begins with the same thought. What if? So Mars One might not be successful, but even so, it will help get people to Mars. Just like in this film, the settlers would face unexpected problems which could probably not be solved with their minimal equipment. And they would have no chance of returning to Earth. Leaving aside the ethical problems, can Mars One work? That depends somewhat on exactly what we mean by work. My personal opinion is that the risk of me dying on the mission must not be greater than 10%. So let's look at Mars One again under this aspect. The settlers fly there in a rocket and have to land. But the technology isn't yet fully developed. I put the likelihood of them actually landing safely at about 20%. That's not a lot. And there's also a second problem. The plan is to launch a flight to Mars every two years. And with each flight, an accommodation module will be transported and docked onto the colony. But the bigger the colony gets from year to year, the more probable it is that something will break down. But they won't have any repair tools or spare parts left. In other words, sooner or later this snowball system will collapse. In my opinion, in three, four, five or six years. Then, at the latest, it will all be over for Mars One. The concept does not foresee a return to Earth. As long as the company exists, supplies could still be provided. But insolvency, perhaps from poor viewing figures, would kill the project, and shortly afterwards, no doubt, the Mars colonists too. Mars One, Mars One is an extremely ambitious program, perhaps even too ambitious, because I'm afraid that the colleagues who are running it have not quite grasped the magnitude of such a mammoth project. I wish them all the best. It's a bold undertaking, but I'm afraid that in the foreseeable future, apart from logistic and moral questions, we will not see anything which will remind us even remotely of the Mars One scenario. To be perfectly honest, I regard it as unethical to go there with basically nothing and then say, fine, I'll end my life here. It cannot be in the interest of space exploration for people to be left to their fate. As we have seen then, the success of a mission depends on the quality of its technology. Engineers describe this as Technology Readiness Level, or TRL. And TRL runs on a scale from 1 to 9. For example, if I merely have the idea for a new technology, it starts as TRL 1. When the idea slowly develops and I have a laboratory prototype which shows me it can work, then I'm at TRL 6. And if I really have a flying model and it's in space, I'm at 8. The highest stage is 9. In that case, the technology has proved itself in space over several years. Take, for example, the present state of driverless cars. They can be seen on the roads already, but they have not yet proved themselves over several years. So we're talking about level 8. What then is the situation regarding a life support system on a Mars mission? Not even a laboratory prototype exists. For the moment, all we have is a well-developed idea. That's level TRL-6. So you can see that the lives of the astronauts depend on the level of development. And since the life support system alone is only at TRL-4, at present, such a mission would not work at all. But the technology for a manned flight to Mars will exist in the near future. The journey would also be a challenge for those participating in the expedition. They would be traveling for at least two years, cooped up together on probably the most dangerous excursion in the history of mankind. Naturally, they would have to be very strong-willed people. 
because they would have a number of deprivations to contend with. They would have to cope with critical phases over a period of at least seven months. And for long stretches in those seven months, they would see nothing but the pitch blackness of outer space. During that time, they would still have to function well as a crew. And on arrival, they would doubtlessly have to contend with situations they could never have imagined beforehand. Weightlessness would be a major problem for travelers to Mars. Tests are already being carried out on the International Space Station to see what effects long-term missions have on the body. Cabin fever is a further problem. After three or four months or so, everyone has a downer. It usually becomes noticeable through someone gorging themselves at breakfast and saying scarcely a word. When we see that, we give the person a bit of encouragement, crack a joke, or pat them on the back. With its Journey to Mars program, NASA is not only developing the spaceship and the corresponding rocket, it is also having to create Martian accommodation from scratch. Various prototypes are being tested. Life side by side for the astronauts in the most confined space is also being simulated. We noticed that over the 30 days in which a spaceflight was simulated, communication within the group dwindled considerably. So if we imagine the crew traveling for an entire year, it would probably mean no one talking to one another. And that's not a good prospect for such a lengthy mission. More successful by comparison is the most current long-term project involving a journey to Mars. A lava landscape on Hawaii formed the background to a special experiment. Three men and three women lived together for a year in a simulated Mars station. Under the direction of NASA and in cooperation with the University of Hawaii, the six test persons experienced Mars for 12 months. Living together functioned. The biggest problem was boredom. But considering a real threat from genuine Martian conditions, that would perhaps never even arise. Naturally, interpersonal issues are also a factor. If I send mixed crews, there will be certainly some corner that will not be captured on camera. I think that's perfectly normal, and it shouldn't be prevented either. However, the consequences also need to be planned in. I would not like to head a mission where six fly in and then seven want to return. Thus, the International Space Station is also a laboratory for social competence. NASA is studying the effects on people who have no privacy. Basically, what we're looking for are people who take a very balanced view of things with a generally good sense of humor, but also the ability to work within a team. Being able to tolerate a high degree of physical strain is something that has become a little less important. No rocket will be able to transport people and equipment to Mars at the same time. Consequently, a mission will consist of several phases. NASA is already working on a transporter. Orion, as it is known, will first fly material to Mars. Only later will it transport passengers to the Red Planet. The American company SpaceX is also working on a Mars spacecraft, the Dragon, has room for seven passengers and can land solely with the help of its engines. A later version will, it is hoped, also be able to fly to Mars. Scientists are working flat out on the development of the space vehicle and its rockets. Do we actually need the huge efforts being made by NASA and SpaceX? Yes, we do. And we need even more from them, because each of these rockets can only put 100 tons in a near-Earth orbit. But we need 300 tons. 
So what's the answer? We would have to make three launches with the present rockets and then assemble things in space. But we've never done that before. It will involve new technology. And only after assembly could a checkout be performed, followed by the famous trans-Mars injection burn. In other words, departure from Mars. Only then would we be on our way there. A journey to Mars would take almost exactly 200 days. You could say, my goodness, how boring. But you'd be wrong. There are some problems to be solved. First of all, the cramped space with six people in one small capsule. You'd have a much closer eye on your colleagues and sometimes emotions would boil over. NASA knows this. That's why it likes to choose women. It knows that with women on board, almost everything runs smoothly. So I'd like to bet that one or two women will be taken along. And then there's another huge problem, cosmic radiation. Hard particles will batter the astronauts from all angles. And in addition, there are the solar protuberances or flares. Particles which would irradiate the astronauts and destroy their DNA. So they need to be protected through the construction of shelters. But they have never been built before. The logistics of a mission to Mars would be enormous, especially because of the duration of the expedition. People will travel to Mars with only the basic necessities. After all, they'll be traveling for quite a long time, at least six months. Everything they need on Mars will already have been sent there. Research into food production is taking place with a view to supplying Mars explorers over a long period. For example, the space agencies are testing various methods of growing plants in zero-gravity conditions. In August 2015, the crew of the ISS enjoyed an extraordinary dinner. Salad had been cultivated on the space station for the first time. Things like cress and potatoes will have to be grown at least as a supplement to classic food. I don't believe that would constitute a full diet because the risk is too great. One case of fungus infestation and everyone would starve to death. Flowers too have already been grown on the space station and they blossomed entirely without natural sunlight. On a Mars mission, however, they would be suitable solely as a gift should the team encounter Martians after all. 3D printers are more practical, and they too are being tested on the space station. They would enable essential spare parts to be produced. The print material would be provided by the planet itself. Thus, 3D printing is regarded as a key technology for a mission to the Red Planet. And NASA has got even more planned. In preparation for a future mission to Mars, the US Space Agency wants to land an unmanned probe on an asteroid and collect a large rock around six meters wide and weighing some 500 tons. The probe would then park the rock in a lunar orbit. Then on a second mission, astronauts would visit the rock orbiting the moon and examine it on the spot. One aim is to find out whether in space, raw materials from an asteroid can be broken down. These could be used for interplanetary missions. Above all though, NASA hopes for an essential technology boost, which would only be made possible in the first place by a mission to Mars. Taking a small asteroid close to the moon and then landing on it and utilizing its resources doesn't make a lot of sense when we have the moon itself. It would be better to land on the moon and then use the regolith, for example, for producing oxygen, which the astronauts need for breathing. The same thing would later be done on Mars. So we're talking about building a factory on the moon and using the regolith to produce the oxygen astronauts need for breathing. The moon would be the perfect place to practice for Mars. And that is precisely what the Russian space agency Roscosmos is planning in cooperation with the European space agency ESA. Together, they plan to search for water on the moon. The moon is very interesting. 
The moon is highly interesting because it can serve as a springboard to outer space. So much can be possible there over the next few years. For example, a lunar base could be established for refueling rockets for a flight onward to Mars. In some ways, the moon could be seen as a little kid's swimming pool. It's relatively easy to get to, and if something goes wrong, a rocket can simply bring people back to Earth right away. When the International Space Station is decommissioned in 2024, the moon could serve as mankind's new scientific outpost in space. Inflatable pressure bodies would constitute the base. Robots would then cover them with layers of regolith. Autonomous 3D printers would provide the necessary support structure. The covering layer of regolith would provide protection from radiation and the impact of tiny meteorites. In the event of an emergency, people could come back from the moon in a few days. We could learn how certain systems for bioregeneration, for training, and so on, could be optimized. And then the big leap to Mars could take place. That really is in a different category. Scientists and engineers want to create a complete moon base, an international research station for developing new technology, and at the same time, a springboard for a journey to Mars, a joint project for the further conquest of space. The question is, I think, whether mankind, because several nations are participating, wants to bear the cost of such a mission. Technologically, I'd say it's a goal that really could be attained in the near future. The space industry hopes for a tremendous boost from projects like the Moon Base and the journey to Mars. Their implementation would give rise to new technologies. But no nation could handle projects of such dimensions on its own. These major activities lend themselves to international implementation. Like the international space stations, ECOMARS is not a national mission. It involves Europe, plus Russia and the United States. And so I believe that in the future, too, astronautical missions will always have this international character. Fortunately, prestige and space race issues now belong to the past. I regard cooperation in the international sphere in particular and in space research as a vital instrument for making a difference geopolitically. The cost of a journey to Mars is estimated at over 400 billion euros. No one country could afford or even wants to finance such a mission on its own. The only way to make interplanetary journeys of discovery possible is through global cooperation. Let's assume that all the problems facing a mission to Mars, including the technological ones, have been solved. Could we then fly off at any time? No. It's only possible to fly every two years. That's because of something called orbit dynamics or orbital mechanics. Let me show you. Let's assume that this is the position of the Sun, the central body which all other planets orbit. Here, for example, is the Earth on its orbit. A little further out, on an elliptical orbit, we have Mars. Let's also assume that at a certain point in time, the Earth is located here. And at that moment, a spacecraft sets off. It would then fly to Mars on an elliptical path. But I couldn't set off any time I felt like because I have to meet Mars out here. So where does Mars have to be located and when? Roughly here at this point. If I set off now, both are moving and converge at this point. In other words, I need a particular constellation between the Earth and Mars. And how often does this constellation occur? Every two years. But now something else has to be considered. If I plan a manned flight to Mars, I'd want to burn as little fuel as possible. I'd be helped in this by the Martian ellipsis. We see that at this point, Mars is further away from the Earth than it is here. So if I start from this side of the Earth, the ellipsis is shorter. I don't need to fly so far and thus save fuel. Now, how often does this constellation occur? 
The answer? Roughly every 15 years. So actually, I can only fly to Mars every 15 years. And the last possibility was in 2018. There was no way we could have made it by then. The next chance after that will be in 2033. And that, the Americans say, will be virtually impossible to achieve. So the next possibility after that will be spring 2048. We would then set off and land on Mars on August the 2nd, 2048. But the countdown for putting people on Mars will begin at least two years beforehand. Several unmanned spacecraft will set out for the Red Planet taking tons of material to the Martian surface. They will also have the landing module on board for the visitors who will arrive later, including the fuel for a return to Earth. On Mars, robots will already be preparing for the arrival of passengers. My theory is that in order to put humans on Mars, there will have to be perhaps 10 preparatory missions for transporting equipment, fuel, and supplies. To make it crystal clear, the aim must, of course, be to take people to Mars and to bring them back again. Anything else, in my view, is not serious space travel. Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral. Standing on the launch pad at the US spaceport is an American heavy cargo rocket. Inside its nose cone is the Mars capsule Orion with an international crew on board. The start of a new era, man's first departure for Mars. The journey to our neighboring planet will take half a year. The landing will take place from the service orbit, the orbit on which a service module will circle Mars. The service module will remain in orbit around Mars because later, when we lift off again, we will want to dock onto it. We will fly around Mars in this direction. Then the landing module will be released. The first thing it will do is release a parachute in order to utilize the resistance of the Martian atmosphere. That's relatively low, but it's still sufficient to slow down the module. Some 50 kilometers above the surface, perhaps just 20, the parachute will be jettisoned and the retro rockets will begin to retard the module's speed even more, right down to zero, to effect a soft landing. When we have achieved that, then we will have finally arrived. On Mars, exploration of the planet is getting underway and the fight for survival. For immediate survival, it is, of course, vital for us to establish the basic requirements, the oxygen, water, and power that first have to be brought from Earth, because it will take a while to grow anything. One problem on Mars will be the long time spent there. The space travelers won't simply be able to fly back again. A reasonable path to Mars and back will always mean someone spending between six months and a year on the planet. Only then are there paths which are suitable because then the vast distance between the Earth and Mars makes even thinking about a journey feasible in the first place. The day of departure has been laid down exactly. The astronauts leave the surface of Mars in their landing module and dock on to the service module in orbit. They reactivate the spacecraft and start their several months journey back to Earth. The last part of the journey gets underway. Easily the most critical part of the entire Mars mission is landing back on Earth. Unfortunately, it won't be possible to land directly because the space vehicle will be arriving from Mars at a staggering 50,000 kilometers an hour. This means hitting the atmosphere, which on this scale is only about two to three centimeters thick with millimeter accuracy. So I can only touch the surface of the atmosphere. This will slow me down and I will fly on back to the moon. On reaching the moon, I will return on an elliptical orbit and have to enter the atmosphere again 
Once more, I have to hit the atmosphere with millimeter accuracy. Again, I hurtle off, but this time only halfway to the moon. Then I will return and repeat the process three, four, five, or six times over a total of around 10 days. Finally, I will pass through into the Earth's atmosphere and land somewhere in an ocean. In the final phase of the return journey, Mother Earth will take control. The force of gravity will bring the Mars travelers back to their home planet. On re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, the astronauts will be protected by a heat shield. Parachutes will retard the capsule even further until it lands in the Pacific Ocean. The end of a long-awaited mission and at the same time, the entry into a new era. Having a permanent manned outpost on Mars would be a really great base for science because we will certainly not fly there and after collecting a couple of rock samples say whether or not the mission has proved worthwhile. We will start to explore a new world and have a foot in the door so that we can quickly go out again with little effort and make new discoveries. And this calls for a permanent outstation. It's no good if I have to wait many years for the next flight to be financed. Many scientists dream of an international research station on Mars, one permanently occupied by alternating teams of researchers and engineers. Such a station would be the first step towards permanent settlement of our neighbor planet. Personally, I find the idea of colonizing another celestial body incredibly exciting because it would launch mankind into a new era. Then the question also arises of who owns the colony? Does it belong to one country or will it be autonomous? Because then there will be countless chances for humanity. We could say that we won't ship all the national boundaries nonsense to Mars. Instead, we'll try something new, something better. We'll establish a direct democracy and totally new legal systems, which function far better. And we'll weed out all the old junk we've gathered on Earth, leave it all behind, and begin as a new humanity. Work is underway on the technology needed for a journey to Mars. It will be operational in the near future. We already have the landing technology. We have regeneration systems which are currently being tested on the ISS. I think it's more a question of whether mankind, because several nations are involved, of course, is prepared to take on the cost of such a mission. Mars lies closer than ever before. So close, you could almost touch it. Today, in my opinion, it will be the early 2030s, at least, before humans will actually land on Mars. But naturally, we can't predict that accurately. After all, technology sometimes makes great leaps. But that would be my estimate as things stand at the moment. I can imagine seeing humans land on Mars in the 2030s. Interplanetary travel, visiting a neighboring planet, taking a walk on Mars, settlers leaving their home planet, the Earth. That is no longer science fiction. It will become reality. I regard 2048 as realistic. I believe it will be even earlier. But first, it's important for us all to agree that man will seize the chance to set foot on the red planet. Man has always been a discoverer and a conqueror. In the past, he explored strange continents. Soon, perhaps, it will be alien planets that will be opened up. Mars could be a start. No one in the world says we absolutely must go to Mars. That's the big topic. It is now assuming massive priority. There is no competition. And that, I believe, is why it will take even longer than we think. What is certain, though, is that man will set foot on Mars, perhaps even in this generation. 
So are manned missions to Mars feasible? There's no doubt that we have the technologies. We know them all. But are they sufficiently well-developed for the task? It will take a few more decades if they're to function really well. And the main criterion is that the risk must not be more than 10%. We must get to Mars and then make it back. And the likelihood of me losing my life must not exceed 10%. Otherwise, I would not take part. Look at the Mars One mission. That would be an absolute disaster. You you wouldn't see me on board. But Journey to Mars doesn't look bad. NASA is behind it. They know the problems, and I'm certain they'll do it. Not on their own, but within an international framework. However, it certainly won't be a German who sets foot on Mars first. But one day, someone will. On August the 2nd, 2048. The Journey to Mars. A journey which will mark the point in time when mankind truly began to conquer the universe.